Oops. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Cecilia Rodriguez, and I'm happy to welcome you here to the opening plenary of the 30th Susanna meeting. I've been a Susanna member for the past eight years, so it's very likely that some of you we have met somewhere around the globe. Uh, today, my role here will be the master of ceremony, and I'm going to walk you through the program that we have prepared for you. While we wait until some more folks get connected, I'll take the chance to make some announcements. I will repeat them a couple of times throughout the meeting, so I hope you won't get much annoyed by that. Last time we checked, we had over 500 participants registered for this very special edition of the Susanna meeting. It's an exciting record. It is the first time that we are convening a fully online meeting. We are happy to come to you wherever you are. My colleague Francisca will tell you more about the network later, but in short, we are a global network and online knowledge management and sharing is part of our day-to-day -day business. We are used to that. In case some of you have already joined any of the past Susanna meetings, you might remember of a joyful and friendly atmosphere. And that's going to be our biggest challenge today, hopefully not a technique, to connect you and have your voice in the meeting. The way for you to interact with us will be commenting using the commenting function either on Facebook or YouTube, depending on which platform you're using. Let us know that you are out there. Share with us your thoughts. If you have a question, please kindly mention to whom it is addressed. You can also tweet using the hashtag uh, Susanna30. Also, get your sm smartphone ready and join menti.com. You can see the meeting code on your screen so we can get to know about more about you. I would like also to say a big, big thank you to the Planning and Organizing Committee of the 30th Susanna Meeting for coming up with such a nice format for this meeting. Also, everyone who has contributed directly, indirectly for that to happen today and in the coming two weeks. We would like you to have a pleasant experience, so make yourself comfortable, get a cup of your favorite drink. We are about to start. I'd like then to invite, to invite Arna and Madeline, who will take us through the first part of the meeting. Arna, Madeline, a warm, warm welcome from me. The floor is yours. Thank you, Cecilia. A uh, big thank you as well from my side to the Susanna Secretariat and all the enthusiastic sanitation practitioners for making this gathering possible, which is a new experience that we have. I'm Arne Panessa. I'm heading the sector program on sustainable sanitation at GIZ, which is hosting the Susanna Secretariat. And Madeleine, uh, who are you? As I always ask when we are on the stage in Sweden, but this time I'll have to ask it in a virtual way. Yeah, hi, I am Madeleine Fugde, and uh, I am usually the person who is the hostess of the Susanna meeting this time of year, um, I, uh, because it's in Stockholm, and I am based in Stockholm. I work with Stockholm Environment Institute, and there I have been working with networks and capacity development and uh, knowledge sharing through uh, Susanna and other networks. So that's what I'm doing. But this year, I will be a kind of online first hostess also. Welcome from online Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if we look back, you have a background in, in the education field. That's what I am reading from your bio. And that's, I think, why I gave you a phone call in 2007 to uh, be ready for the first uh, Susanna meeting. Uh, and since then, in many, many times, we then were together opening it, and it's good to do it now in the virtual way. The virtual format yeah. allows us to have easier participation from around the globe. Let, let's hope we can be again face to face in Stockholm, but then bring together the positive sides of the different worlds. Um, yeah, I think we would like to welcome you to the 30th Susanna meeting. It's a very special meeting for us in many ways. The pandemic has surprised us and affected the way we live, the way we work and the way we relate to each other. Not to mention the relevance that the slogan leave no one behind has gained in the past months. 
we probably still need some time to grasp the side effects of isolation and we might be feeling it for some years. The pandemic might be a time marker for the present generations, the before and after Corona in our lives. For us, it's not only about switching the online formats and pretending that there isn't anything going on outside. We are aware that many of us are in grief for losing dear people, are exhausted by fighting the virus and even tired just for having to reinvent the way we do even the most basic things, like being in touch with people we care. Yes, and that's what we are doing here today. We reinvent the way we produce knowledge together. And I hope um, that can be as well a positive experience for all of us to have this first completely virtual uh, Susanna meeting. Uh, some features about this 30th Susanna meeting, uh, apart from being fully online, uh, we had usually a one day which was which was packed and a roadshow on what happened last year and got us ready for the Stockholm and uh, the Stockholm World Water Week. Now we're having two weeks and there is a total of 18 sessions in these two weeks and I think there are more than 100 enthusiasts who have prepared them and I hope we'll have a high participation from the more than 12,000 Susanna members and I'm looking very much forward to that. The working group lead, the regional chapter coordinators, Susanna partners and members have all contributed to this. Uh, we hope you'll find some interest in, in all these sessions and I'm looking forward to this and uh, Madeline, will you introduce the agenda a little bit to us of today? Yeah, I just want to add to you, Arne, that we really want to emphasize also the networking opportunity because we feel that uh, we are quite isolated uh, where we are. And um, so that's why we had all these enthusiast organizing session and there's space in the sessions for networking, for sharing. So please join us. And some of the network sessions are not really fully planned. So there is still uh, an opportunity to contribute. Yeah, but for this opening session, it is ready and also very excited. We are so pleased. We have two eminent keynote speakers, uh, Ilva Schwin from SIDA and Hind Katip Otman, from, uh, CEO for the Water and Sanitation Collaborative Council. <clears throat> um, we will have, as always, an interesting update on what's going on uh, at the Susanna Network. And uh, the, the activities we have uh, ahead of us, because there are a lot of interesting processes going on in Susanna, and it's time to get some news about that. We will then have some really uh, interesting and I think a little bit uh, on the edge of new knowledge and uh, on the debate and uh, high relevant topics uh, presented by um, uh, <coughs> Fresia Luceca, who will be talking about decolonizing the wash sector. And I think this is very, very interesting and uh, looking forward to that. And further on, we will also have an insight in what are the potentials and are there potentials for uh, getting, seeing how climate relate to sanitation and can we also use climate finance for sanitation and wastewater management. And that will be presented for, from Shibiasa Pensulu, uh, based in Seoul and the Clim uh, Green Climate Fund. Yeah, uh, so that's more what we'll do this hour, I think, Arne. But before that, I think it's a time for an introduction. Am I right? I think we have the Mentimeter now, and because it's, let's see how we can get uh, uh, those in touch who are around there. And so the first question is that, from where are you joining? And please type in your country, city, or be specific like so far, and, and let's see what's popping up here. And I see there's a lot of India. So let's see, there's a kitchen store in Sweden, very cool. Beijing box style, <laughs> great. Let's see what else is typed in. It'll take some time. Usually at this time of the meetings, we have meters of the participant 
presenting themselves, but it's a little bit difficult. So we'll do it through the Mentimeter. And here's coming. Yeah. By the sea, sounds nice. Okay. Stockholm, I'm happy Stockholm is on, even though I'm not particularly based in Stockholm, but uh, it's good that we know that Stockholm is here, presented. Switzerland, yes, nice. What else do we have? By the lake, yeah, cool. Bonn. Berlin. It's coming. Jordan. Okay, we're jumping to the next question. Those who haven't, go to www.menti.com and use the code 5330025. That's the one which is uh, in the header. Uh, and then give it a go. <laughs> well, I could say it's my 30th Susanna meeting, I think maybe 28 or 27. I'm really happy to see the blue one because when we were organizing this Susanna meeting, we really understand that this is an opportunity for many people to join the Susanna meeting who hasn't had the opportunity to be in the places where we have organized these 30 meetings. So uh, happy to see all these new first meeting participants, very welcome, very exciting. Uh, oh. This this is can take some time. Philosophical question. Yeah. And in this um, <clears throat> context, I would like to invite you to a session that we have uh, on these topics later on in the week. And um, we are all experiences this pandemic, and I think it, we can learn very much, you know, from uh, this kind of uh, crisis. We will have a different future, and we have so much to learn and share. Very interesting. I think Tigers is the best one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's also the underestimation of how important it is for us actually to socially connect. Uh, that was the driver for this meeting. We just needed to be in touch again and to talk about that that is so important and we see it especially during the pandemic uh, so <laughs> we can be together and speak about this that's good country offices are doing well without constant visits from headquarters stuff <laughs> yeah headquarters as well doing good without this must COVID. be GM set. <laughs> Okay, I think we're back. So I yeah. think now uh, I'm I going to introduce the keynotes. And I'm going to say bye-bye. We will not see me any longer. So Arne, super yeah. nice to be with you in the start. See yes, you I during the week. Yeah. Year and before, yeah, but then in a different setting. Good. Okay, so we're coming to our keynote speakers, and I use this moment to as well uh, sending regards from the German ministry. They were eager to come and couldn't do it at the last minute, but the positive news from the German ministry is that they're reorganizing themselves and putting a stronger focus on One Health and even have a separate uh, entity for WASH. But that's on sort of the regard side, and now it's uh, Ilva Schwinn. She's WASH program specialist at the Department for International Organizations and Policy Support 
at the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're looking very much forward to your remarks and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to say a few words on behalf of SIDA today. Uh, my main message is that SIDA, as one of the long-standing partners and supporters, we are as supportive as ever. But I will also say a few more things. I'm actually very um, pleased that this uh, seminar took place online and uh, that we are able to gather as much uh, as many as we are and that actually the World Water Week in Stockholm didn't interfere with the Susanna Network uh, this year. We have um, not been able uh, to attend the Susanna Network for some while and, and therefore I'm ex especially happy to be able to join today. I'm very inspired and encouraged to see the very rich community of Susanna. It's people from all over the world uh, interest and interested and passionate about sanitation. SIDA has been a long-standing partner um, and supporter of Susanna. And while Swedish political priorities have put the light beams towards wash and sanitation at varying intensity, SIDA has continuously supported sanitation, both as part of our health strategies, but also through our environment strategies. And we all know that sanitation is such a cross fit that it would also fit in many other strategies. When priorities are on employment, we argue, let channel funds invest in sanitation. When priori priorities are on gender, go sanitation. When priorities is purely on you know, poverty reduction, we say sanitation is such a strategic place to start. Uh, CEDA is the Agency for Development Cooperation in Sweden and governed by strategies by the Swedish government. Our main objective is to enable anyone living in poverty to create, to be able to create a better life for oneself. And uh, while we have different strategies for a number of bilateral cooperation, we also have some strategies for cooperation at global level when initiatives uh, with a global reach has an added value. And it's through these different uh, strategies that we support normative development, multilateral organizations and networking. And um, I'll get back a little bit more on the networking piece. Beyond our objective to implement the different strategies, we strive towards the highest aid efficiency as possible. Aid funds will never be enough and we need to do what we can to have the most leverage in and anything we do we need to be smart strategic and use all the fund in the most strategic way and obviously us who's in this seminar today who work with sanitation we know that this is an amazing investment and it can be fantastically efficient to address many different development obstacles or challenges we at SEED are very content about the development of the Susanna network and the resource base. Um, from an economic point of view, we can look at it as a very strategic investment. It's like a grown-up child uh, that has uh, developed and uh, expanded knowledge on its own uh, beyond what was really initially envisioned. And... Uh, as you may be able to, to detect, I'm very passionate about sanitation. And, uh, and it's fascinating that once you unpack it uh, and understand the potential uh, in terms of both the protection for the public health, but also for the environment, uh, one can also have so many other added benefits, uh, such as um, uh, work creation and uh, general economic development. And, but, but let me go back a little bit to the networking. Um, thinking of the Susanna network, I think of both it's the network for professionals, um, enriching um, uh, each other, us uh, from each other, 
uh, from very different angles, perspective, uh, different needs and innovative ideas. And we learn from the network and um, enables us to leapfrog a little bit to avoid doing the same mistake. It is challenging to work and, and uh, really um, uh, manage everything we would like to. Uh, and, and we can really uh, learn from each other in this sense. But it's also a network for organizations. And as a funder, uh, we see that support a number of different organizations. And, and the worst thing I can imagine is to have a battle in the field, a, co a competition around funds that limits one another. And when we see that as organizations that we support actually join forces and and create synergies and uh, and they they pull in the same direction that is really one of the the main added values we can see when we support different parts of the puzzles together and we can see that it's uh, uh, gaining traction so so it's fantastic to also see this networking for organizations. And apart from a rich technical resource, uh, the network base, for me, Susanna is also a thermometer. Uh, I, I look through the different working groups and I, sitting based in Stockholm, I can, I feel that I at least get a little sense from what is cooking, what is really engaging people, what is uh, challenging, what is frustrating. And, and that is what we in Stockholm need to understand and to, to um, have with us all the time when we do uh, different assessment and uh, needs assessment and uh, allocate fundings for different initiatives. Um, I, I want talk a lot about CEDA's priorities, but as you may understand, climate change is very much on the high on the agenda. Everything we do, uh, it's essential it has a climate change uh, aspect or consideration or has at least been assessed. And, and you know, it pleases me to know that it's also um, one of the key um, issues with sanitation, benefits with sanitation, that it is um, something that we can uh, really make use of in, in the battle towards uh, climate change. All kinds of environmental concerns, including biodiversity. The pandemic has obviously been one of the main topics at sea that is spring. But Bringing me a little bit back to what is um, even more on, on um, of relevance to the Santana network is, of course, the circular economy, uh, economic development, um, work opportunities, and it's fantastic to have this network uh, to learn from and and to understand what we can do more to enable sanitation businesses to to thrive and to um, uh, how how what we can do best to uh, to support the development of a circular economy and how we can make it best use of sanitation efforts i think i will uh, close my little note here and uh, I'd like to wish you the very best and continu continuation of all this week. And I'll follow as much as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elva. Thank you very much for your uh, supporting remarks. And uh, I think when you said that we should unite in the sector and we should bring different initiatives together, I think that's what we were uh, aiming for from the very beginning. And uh, in the recent years uh, one collaboration that has come up more strongly is the one with the water supply and sanitation collaborative council which will have a new name soon but we'll hear that from our next uh, keynote speaker and that's hind katip otman uh, she's the chair of the water supply and sanitation council before she was has served as the managing director of the gavi alliance 
and uh, UN AIDS as regional director in the Middle East and North Africa region. She had also directed country programs at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Prior to that, she worked with UNICEF for 16 years in progressively more senior roles in several regions, including the Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Africa. Ms. Kathy Botman's academic background is in sociology and public administration with a field of specialization in healthcare services. So uh, I'm looking really very much forward to your remarks and I think it's, it's great you found time to share a few words, words with us and, and with this background, it's, it's uh, yeah, I'm excited. Close Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's really a real pleasure for me to be joining you. And, and I want to thank the Susanna uh, Secretariat for actually convening this meeting. Uh, it's not easy at, uh, at this time, and uh, you managed to make sure that you convene the network uh, across the world. Uh, it is a special time. It's a difficult time. We also meet uh, our, uh, we also miss our meeting in, uh, in Stockholm uh, to make sure that we touch base with all the networks and all the relevant stakeholders who are re really working in the sector. And, and I think uh, this is a, a great alternative. And it's a great opportunity for me to speak uh, this afternoon uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the WSSCC or the Water uh, Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council and uh, the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund moving forward. As you know that uh, uh, you know we have been you have been a great partner uh, to WSCC, and we want to make sure that we continue this collaboration. We continue tapping on the network on your knowledge, and as we move forward to sanitation and hygiene fund, and and what I would like to speak to you uh, this afternoon is why the sanitation and hygiene fund and what was uh, uh, compelling for us to move forward uh, with the sanitation and hygiene fund. And let me just stop here to also recognize Sweden. Uh, and thank Eva for her uh, uh, also uh, um, her address to all of us. Uh, Sweden has been a great supporter to the council and is a great supporter to the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund going forward. So we're really also pleased uh, to see a key partner uh, with us today and and did this uh, uh, opening uh, address. So why that? Why a, a Sanitation and Hygiene Fund? I mean, I'm not going to sit here and. Uh, because obviously uh, with the two uh, important reports that came out in 2019 uh, that told us that the gap is getting bigger and not, small, and not uh, smaller, that one in every two people do not have access to safely managed sanitation services, that nearly 10% of the world population still resort to open defecation, and more than one in three people do not have basic hand washing facilities at home, one in three schools, uh, and one in uh, five health centers facilities do not have sanitation and hygiene services. That is really uh, uh, a lot uh, to, for us to come to terms with. And, and for us in the council, we have taken a step back. Uh, it was 2019 was, was a year for us to really reconsider uh, our role in the sector, what we have done, what was the impact and how we can do things differently. And, uh, and when we did that, and we had a midterm review that told us that actually our current business model uh, was not uh, uh, servicing the sector as it should, uh, while we can uh, speak about certain successes for us to have to make ways and work in unusual ways collaboratively with, uh, with our stakeholders, with, the, uh, with the equally all our partners. So that's why we reverted to a uh, much more of an ambitious strategy, uh, a strategy that calls for the sector to be connected. And, uh, and you know, when I was doing my research about Susanna, it was like music to my ears when I looked into your website and saw how you position sanitation as actually an investment in sanitation to safeguard investments in health and to ensure that we work in ways that uh, to protect also uh, uh, achievements in global health and at the same time working to ensure that we contain uh, uh, pandemics and, and obviously uh, uh, all of that, we're thinking behind why our strategy really connects with, with global health, uh, connects with education, because obviously not having the proper sanitary services in schools have their impact on, uh, on uh, boys and girls, but much more on girls and adolescent girls who are also struggling uh, when they to support 
uh, their efforts and to, to maintain them in schools. And uh, it connects really to ensure that uh, uh, we mainstream menstrual health and hygiene and, and we mainstream it in a way that we really work to uh, uh, improve uh, policies around it, that we give uh, young girls a voice, uh, that we link it to uh, to rights, we link it not just to rights, but we link it also uh, to health, to sexual reproductive health, as well as uh, a women empowerment and, and the gender agenda as a whole. Uh, the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund will also uh, bring uh, ways in which we can continue uh, supporting uh, uh, families uh, to ensure that they have basic sanitary services at home. So the, the, uh, when the, the steering committee has endorsed a sanitation and hygiene fund, we started uh, really bringing the learning from uh, important uh, fi funding organizations such as uh, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, and Gavi. Uh, both organizations, I had the pleasure and honor to work with them. And I actually could see their impact and success in providing a model that is much more country focused. Uh, it builds on national strategies, engages uh, uh, much in better ways to engage with the political leaders, with the political commitment, uh, works to unleash domestic resources, and actually build a huge network at country level that is then translated to region, then translated to global. So while we will be putting the country uh, in the center, it's important to note that the fund will want to work with a partnership at country level. And partnership at country level means representative from different sectors, uh, uh, representatives from civil society, as well as community groups, as well as women groups, uh, as well as uh, uh, different sectors, uh, including finance, education, uh, water, uh, environment, uh, uh, and, and obviously uh, climate uh, change. So uh, by the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund, really it is designed uh, to act in different ways uh, and, and uh, uh, to act at a scale uh, with uh, prove, uh, to fund proven interventions and innovations to infuse the urgency and the intensity that has for a long time been lacking and absent in the sector. Uh, we know that for all of for all of us who have been working in the sector, you know, the, this sector has been chronically underfunded and worked in isolation of many other sectors. And I think what the SHF uh, is really designed to uh, to be a vehicle to invest in to invest large sums of money. Of funds for maximum impact, very much similar to Global Fund and Gavi. Uh, it will work uh, by assigning grants with eligible countries, and those eligible countries are going to be the countries that are most left behind with a large number of uh, uh, fragility and, and people that uh, are in, were living in underserved. On the contrary, I think we're trying to make sure that we give those that we give them a voice and we escalate their needs to, to ensure that they are actually covered in national strategies, that national strategies at the country level are funded and that we, uh, the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund would provide catalytic funding to invest in sanitation uh, national strategies, but also that connect with other sectors. We believe that the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund is, is a partnership because you know, it's going to continue to be uh, uh, working out of Geneva. Uh, it's not going to be an implementing organization. It's going to be looking uh, at a large number of partners who can influence, uh, first of all, a strategy development, but also influence the implementation and support the implementation to the, to the furthest communities with, with a large number of people who are in need. And, and, and that is why we are very proud with uh, our partnership with Susanna. And we want, on the contrary, to strengthen it. Because we believe that as a fund, we cannot not at all. We had a, a round table with uh, sector partners uh, uh, just last week, uh, to which we have explained the vision and how we cannot uh, be an implementation space that we are uh, definitely want to be a disruptor. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we work uh, getting out of the status quo and that we bring the sense of urgency in the sector by linking it to a number of other sectors. Obviously, I think uh, COVID uh, is, is a constraint as well as an opportunity. And I believe right now when the whole world, the donor climate, uh, uh, the, the climate in donor capitals is that a lot of money is going to prevent, mitigate, the impact of COVID, but also to prepare the world for future epidemics. 
that we have to finish the agenda on sanitation and hygiene. That the first message that goes out usually is sanitation, is hygiene. And having worked at Gavi, and I've seen the impact of cholera on, on communities that do not have uh, uh, access to basic sanitary services, and that a vaccine alone in any given community, then we really have to think of other ways. And sanitation and hygiene are critical for us to prevent pandemics and epidemics. And that's why a sanitation and hygiene fund with those principles that will work in partnership, that will invest at big scale, uh, that will uh, target uh, countries and communities that are, have been left behind and giving a voice to all the partners. I mean, the whole idea is that we will be working uh, rather than with one entity at country level, we'll be working with a partnership. So we want to make sure that coordinating committees are not just committees that come together on specific occasions, but they are strong to continue working, submitting a proposal for the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund, which will get funded uh, based on its technical merits, based on an independent review. And those, and we work with them to strengthen their voice, uh, to make sure that uh, they are at the level that can influence uh, policies, engage in, uh, in a, a high level dialogue, uh, including with uh, uh, political leaders that come with a large number of partners. So um, that is uh, basically uh, a why a sanitation and hygiene fund and how a sanitation and hygiene fund is really work going to work with a large number of partners. We don't want to duplicate. Uh, we want to rely on what exists there. We want to be working uh, with the partners in ways that bring their comparative advantage uh, to uh, the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund, that uh, we can also strengthen uh, their voice at national level, regional level, and global level by leveraging the funds that the Sanitation and Hy Hygiene Fund will, will uh, uh, put uh, uh, for countries. Obviously, uh, as of uh, beginning of next year, it means that uh, the council will no longer exist. Uh, but there will be a sanitation and hygiene fund that's building on the success of uh, uh, WSCC, uh, bringing uh, with it the partners of WSCC, making sure that the principles and the achievements uh, that uh, uh, we have achieved through the Global Sanitation Fund uh, 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 brought up to a different level, whereby they're going to be uh, much more uh, a discussion for us uh, at, a, at a country, a higher level, to engage with all partners. So um, uh, taking this forward, we hope that working with the Sanitation Hygiene Fund, working with a large number of partners with us, will create a big impact. We've seen that uh, uh, with, uh, with Global Fund and Gavi. We've seen when they work as an alliance, as a partnership, bringing the different voices, bringing technical agencies, supporting the countries to ensure that they have the technical support and the technical assistance they need, that it is local solutions rather than imported solutions. Thinking about how do we bring innovation and the private sector uh, to have to play a, a key role by making sure that e even innovations in, in the space of uh, uh, commodities is, uh, is uh, homemade solutions, is affordable at an accessible price, is something that uh, obviously will ensure long-term sustainability. financing. And when we speak about co-financing, we don't want definitely to be punitive uh, to any partner or to the countries, but rather making sure that the costs of sanitation are built in, into national budgets uh, and uh, they are increased. So uh, once uh, these countries uh, stop being eligible for additional financing through the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund, we know that the money uh, continues uh, to, uh, to serve and that uh, the programs are sustainable long beyond uh, Sanitation and Hygiene Fund. I'm pleased to say that, uh, uh, lastly, that I'm very pleased to say that we will launch the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund on the side of UNGA. Uh, it will be launched with the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Amina Mohammed, and uh, we want to make sure that our partners are with us and they really support uh, the idea of having a fund that puts uh, money at a much higher scale and work in different ways for us to get out of the status quo and make sure that we leave really walk the talk of leaving no one behind. I thank you again.
uh, thank you also for taking this initiative to keep us connected, to keep the world connected at a time when uh, we, we all feel we are isolated in our little uh, places and our little, our, the cities where we live. Thanks again, and I'm looking forward uh, to, to continue engaging with you. Thank you very much, Hint. Uh, also, thank you very much, Eva. We do a big thank you from the Susanna community. We are very great for the collaboration that we have both with CIDA and the WSSCC. Um, I think um, in the coming presentation, we will have a look uh, also at some key activities that the, this collaboration had enabled in the, in the past years. So I would like to say a good hello for everyone who has just joined us. The list of country doesn't stop to grow. Thank you very much for everyone who has posted a comment. Welcome from Filipina, Filipinas, Uganda, Peru, Brazil, Eritrea, Canada, Cameroon, Ghana, Costa Rica. Welcome, everyone. Uh, in case you have questions or comments, please feel free to post it as the comment in the comment session either from Facebook or YouTube, we will gather them afterwards and address them in the discussion round. So next, I would like to introduce two, dear, two very dear colleagues to me. Um, and very important pieces in the Susanna history. Francisca Folk from the Susanna Secretariat. Francisca is a fundamental part of the Susanna Secretariat and a few good manager of, of the whole team since 2018. Her background is in economics, and I assume that she was born a believer. She is probably another one of us who is coming from another sector and getting stuck in the sanitation community just because of passion. She has the mammoth task of connecting all the dots within this very complicated net, talking to every people and making sure that ideas come true. Suzanne, uh, Francisca, welcome. And also I'd like to invite to the stage Leonie Hyde-Smith, who is a member of the Susanna Change Management Task Force, also known as CMTF. Luana, uh, Leonie has also worked in, in the Susanna Secretariat eight years ago before moving to water and sanitation projects for GFA in Kenya and Zambia, among others. She's now one of the eight warriors that committed back in 2019 to prepare Susanna for the big organizational and operational change process. The CMTF has put in place uh, by the Susanna Core Group as an decision-made body, um, and we have a lot of trust in their work and well-thought decisions. The whole group is committed to this job on an in-kind basis. So our, we are incredibly grateful for the, the education to the network, and we look forward to hear about their plans for Susanna. Welcome, the two of you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for your very kind introduction. And hello to everyone uh, out there in front of their screens on YouTube and Facebook. I'm so happy that the two weeks of Susanna meeting are now finally starting. I uh, will have the honor to give you an introduction to Susanna, its goals, the roles, and what's new. Um, those who have earlier clicked in the Mentimeter that it's their 20th or even 30th meeting might take the chance to get a cup of coffee. But as we have seen, a lot of you already uh, said, responded, it's their first meeting. Um, this might help you to orient yourself a bit in what Susanna is and what we do. Uh, first of all, Susanna is an open, dynamic and global network of 12,500 individual members and 360 partner organizations as of today, working along the same vision for sustainable sanitation for all. Susanna's strengths are definitely its members, so it's all you. You who contribute with your time, energy, knowledge, passion, and ideas. And especially in the past weeks and months, it was really impressive to see the motivation and commitment from the network. So a big thank you at this point to each and every one of you for making Susanna what it is. Similarly with our partners, our organizational partners who are 
here represented by 50% from local or international NGOs, which is followed by around 20% private sector, 14% universities, and also a few percent multilateral organizations and government owned entities. What's the goal of Susanna? Our common goal as Susanna members and partners is to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs by promoting sanitation systems based on principles of sustainability. The nice storytelling and the graphic you can see here comes from the 10th Susanna anniversary celebration in 2017. Susanna was founded in the year 2007 to prepare and align stakeholders for the International Year of Sanitation in 2008. One of the first actions was to jointly define five sustainability criteria. Since then, the network continued to grow. On the 10th anniversary, you can see on the right, it was a big celebration. The network discussed what the shift from the MDGs to the SDGs meant for Susanna. The outcome was a new vision and our interlinkages document called Sustainable Sanitation and the SDGs, Interlinkages and Opportunities. So this paper describes how sustainable sanitation links to all SDGs and outlines challenges and opportunities this represents. Coming to the roles of Susanna, what can the network be used for and how does it achieve its impacts? There are four main roles that Susanna can play. A coordination and discussion platform, a sounding board, a contribution to the policy dialogue, and not least, a working platform. Um, what you can see here is the Susanna circle of knowledge and exchange, I, how I would call it. Susanna hosts an extensive online platform for knowledge management and exchange with a very active online discussion platform, a library, thematic working groups, regional chapters, a partner and project database, a video and photo database, and of course, social media channels. An important aspect of discussions and networking are the Susanna meetings. They are to connect and bring people from the sector together. The meetings should inform about current trends and hot topics in the policy dialogue for sustainable sanitation. This year, we are hosting the first online global Susanna meeting over the course of two weeks. So if at some point we will go back to a face-to-face -face format and stick to this timing, it will be kind of a Susanna summer camp, which would be fine for me. Susanna's role as a sounding board is fulfilled by bringing actors from the sanitation sector together and have them communicating and debating in a neutral environment. Some of the major publications that arose from this are the Compendium for Sanitation Systems and Technologies, also for emergency settings now. The Emergency Compendium is also available um, since this year as interactive platform online hosted by Susanna. Susanna is contributing to the policy dialogue by providing evidence-based knowledge through its members and partners to influence public policies. It is also contributing by including the different constituencies into its discussions, from small NGOs, grad, grassroots organizations, to universities, UN, UN agencies and donors. Lastly, by allowing members of the sector to ultimately speak louder with one voice. Lastly, Susanna is a working platform through task forces like the Change Management Task Force, thematic working groups and regional chapters. So much for a quick introduction. You are to learn more about Susanna in the coming two weeks, I guess, and a few words on what's new in Susanna. In a network of 12,000 members, it won't be remotely possible for me to describe everything that has happened in the past year within three minutes, so I apologize for that. And I will only give a glimpse on the latest developments. But all of these aspects I will outline now will have their own dedicated session in the coming weeks where you will hear more about it. On World Toilet Day 2019, we have launched a new forum category in yellow, you see here, providing a dedicated space for discussions around equity and inclusion. 
Through close collaboration with the WSCCC, we were also able to provide more moderation capacities and the spike in members due to the move of the WSCCC LinkedIn community of practice to the Susanna Forum. Beginning of 2020, we have also jointly with WSCCC launched the sanitation event calendar. The great thing about this calendar is that it is open for all Susanna partner organizations to upload the, and feature their trainings, conferences, webinars, and other online events. Um, so these events are now also included in the forum digest, which goes out to 10,000 recipients. So your event would have quite a big reach. Second, our dear regional chapters. Um, they launched a brand new website last year to fulfill their roles as regional knowledge hubs. And next week, we are really excited to launch our fourth and latest regional chapter, Africa, together with a new African Civil Society Network on Water and Sanitation and with support from WSCCC. The chapters will also host bilingual sessions on gender and wash and sewage testing for COVID-19, which is based on input from the thematic discussion in the forum of the India chapter. Finally, our thematic working groups are very active. Most of them will host a session in the coming two weeks, so you will hear from them. There's also a new discussion paper on WASH and health called Prevention is the Best Medicine that received very valuable inputs and reviews from almost all working group leads. And thanks to the German Toilet Organization for coordinating this big process. It will be presented and discussed in a session on Friday. Another focus was and still is on the safety of sanitation workers. Susanna's latest publication jointly um, with FSMA being a photo story from fecal sludge management workers in Zambia. Uh, the stars of this publication, Samson and Stanley, did also take part in the FSM Operator Skills Challenge in Kampala at AFWA Congress beginning of this year. Again, thank you all for being here. I'm very much looking forward to connecting with you in one of the 18 sessions in the coming two weeks. And with this, I am handing over to Leonie from the Change Management Task Force. Over to you, Leonie. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I will just briefly speak on behalf of the CMTF just to give an overview on what has happened over the last months and actually a year. So it's nearly exactly a year ago that the CMTF met in person and also um, kind of like met for the first time um, in Stockholm. And um, so in Stockholm um, last year, we um, had our introduction from the um, group of four and from the Susanna Secretariat. And we had some discussions with the core group. Um, we got to know each other, we discussed the values, the expectations and the needs. We then um, um, started to discuss and agreed on a decision-making procedure and we actually um, plan. This work plan, and I will um, say this now, has a little bit changed um, due to recent pandemics um, and other issues. So, but we actually had a chance in December um, last year, just before the pandemic, um, to meet again in person in Bonn. Um, before that, we had like various calls. We um, reviewed all the Susanna documents or all the relevant documents and we updated our own TOR. In Bonn, we then um, discussed um, our, um, we actually discussed that we um, need a little bit uh, more, yeah, more structure to us. So we um, we finally decided that we will have like a chair who's Francis who can't be here today and a vice chair, which is me. Um, and then we also updated the Susanna mission and vision statement, all based on the work that was already. Um, done so no big changes just um, some update and then what was quite an important step for us we um, did our budget um, so for those who are not so aware of the CMTF process so we have been tasked with actually finding a new 
more sustainable um, structure for Susanna um, kind of um, finding a new way how Susanna should be governed and also financed in the long term. Um, for that, we, we are eight individuals of very different backgrounds who have um, volunteered their time, but none of us is a kind of like core um, organizational development expert. This is why from the beginning of um, forming this um, forming the CMTF, it was agreed that we would um, get support from an organizational development consultant. Um, that's actually what the budget is all about. So it's about this external support. We all um, work voluntarily. So um, it's not about paying us. Um, so that was then followed up with the core group and the Susanna Secretariat. Um, and this is where we actually are at the mo moment. Um, I don't know if some of you did um, receive the very nice um, written request for funding from Francis. Um, so there was some, um, some confusion over who should actually pay for this external support. There were some changes. So um, that then all took a little bit longer. This is why we are a little bit behind schedule at the moment, also because of Corona, just workloads had changed and everything has changed. We have in the meantime worked on the theory of change. There is a draft version available. We are working at the moment at the code of conduct and at the Susanna strategy. And once we have actually um, finalized the recruitment process for the organizational development consultant, that will be available to um, then work together with us on the change structure. Um, so yeah, that's where we are now. So all a little bit slowed down, but we are still um, committed. Um, the CMTF um, is definitely committed until the end of the year. Um, this is an extension of the original commitment which was until now. Um, so we thought we would have this new structure now, but that has changed. Um, and that's kind of um, um, the update from us. So now the next step is get this organizational development consultant on board and then really start working on kind of like the phase, the, the concept and the decision making. So we are still kind of, from like the um, original um, consultancy architecture for this um, change management process, we are still kind of like at the beginning of the conceptualization phase. Um, so that's actually all for me. So the CMTF would be happy to receive feedback and comments and um, in this meeting, and hopefully we can address some of these. Thank you, Franzi. Thank you, Leonie. I've seen there are some comments on the forum. Um, I just would like to say that they will be here. Franzi will be here the whole week and can take up questions whenever you are. Just a quick feedback for the question from IRC Communications. Yes, there is a strong collaboration with the Rural Water Supply Network. And on Tuesday, uh, 25th of August at 1.30 p.m., there will be a session on the discussion forum, which is one aspect of this collaboration. All right. So thank you, Francis. Thank you, Leonie. Um, and now I would like to invite Ms. Ofrezi Luseka, who is a very dear speaker to us. Uh, Euphrasia is a water governance expert with 11 years of progressive experience in leadership and strategy development in the wash sector. At a period of confronting decreasing aid in the water sector, she specialized in water public policy and institutional strengthening of water utilities towards enhancing their operational efficiency and overall credit worthiness. Euphrasia holds a Bachelor in Environmental Science and Community Development and a MSc in Education for Sustainability. Welcome, Euphrasia. The floor is yours. 
And to the, ho to the ones who are just arrived now, welcome to the meeting. If you have questions and comments, just type in using the commenting function of your platform. Euphrasia, nice to have you here with us. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Euphrasia Luseka. I'm a water governance expert and I work with water utilities um, mainly in Kenya. Now in Kenya, uh, the water utilities have had two main roles. Uh, both on water and sanitation services provision. Previously, they only focused on water and sewerage services, but recently the mandate has now been extended to water and sanitation services provision. The agenda today is on sanitation, and one may wonder, are there decolonization challenges in sanitation sector? Sure, they are there. And my discussion will focus on the same in the Kenyan context. The, so therefore, my, the title of my presentation will be basically on the harsh barrier to sanitation access in Kenya. So while the ODF levels in rural Kenya increase, why are consumers still drinking shit? I say this from the perspective of poor toilets construction, their use, and groundwater contamination. And I believe we can all be able to relate. So as we celebrate 10 years of uh, human rights to water and sanitation, and in my country, 47 years after the unveiling of the first sewer master plan for Nairobi, which is Kenya's capital city, um, Kenya's water service regulator report this year indicated that only 17% of Kenyans have access to sewer sanitation coverage. This uh, is a 1% increase after a stagnant 16% for the previous two years. In a 2018 report from World Bank, overall only 30% of Kenyans have access to improved sanitation. That is the use of sanitation facilities that hygienically separate excreta from human contact. This means that approximately 30 million Kenyans are still using unsafe sanitation methods like rudimentary types of latrines and almost 6 million are defecating in the open. So how did this happen? In a sector that has a lot of donors, as per our national treasury assessment. I usually say, always a lesson, never a failure. So I will withhold names of entities in my presentation as I don't believe this discussion is on bashing efforts, including the failures, but I believe it's about coming up with solutions that are demand responsive for the services that last by embracing equality against white supremacy. Remember the problem is not white people, but white supremacy. So almost eight years ago, donors supported some water utilities in Kenya on adoption of DTF and urine diversion toilets. In some areas, the concept failed before takeoff, while others, it failed during the project implementation phase. So why was it the value for money realized? Well, this is the untold story that has been silenced all this time. Firstly, the donors were warned prior by the water utility staff, among other stakeholders, that the project design will not work. But this was ignored. So the, pers the, the issues of parachute project design approach and one size fits all in a highly contextualized sector like sanitation, it never works. And at the same time, we all agree that once you get the concept wrong, you get the whole project wrong. So the whole implementation is a failure. But then again, the water utility highlighted concerns on issues of space, given that DTF were to be built within the community. Yet most of our slums are already in encroached land. With the unplanned design of housing, how will the exhausters even access the toilets? Also, the selection of target population was a challenge. Part of the targeted population are from areas with what in Kenya we call plots. These are residential areas with approximately 10 houses and above. And when nature calls, it is hard to decide on which toilet you want to use and how to control users is also a challenge, especially when the caretaker of uh, these residential areas is not there. And actually they're usually not there the whole day. Then again, in this regard, the donor was advised that the project instead focuses on rural areas. However, white supremacy saw the project focusing on number of toilets and DTF units constructed. Why was there an um, infrastructure focus only instead of number of people accessing services that last? While SDG 10 is clear on ensuring that marginalized people are prioritized as targets, 
At the same time, civil society organizations could support address this towards social accountability of all partners, including the donor and users using the toilets for the right purpose, but they are underfunded to execute the concept and the principle of leave no one behind in its totality. Another challenge was also um, being pegged on the issues of the time factor. And now this comes from the perspective where the donor is focused on attaining results in the quickest way possible so that they can be able to get the next funding. And this that uh, doing so in compromise of sanitation infrastructure and systems that provide services that last. Also speaking of inequalities on resource allocation, uh, DTF units are constructed for WSPs, and this basically means the water utilities, yet most of these entities do not own exhausters. In situations where they are con uh, constructed on credit facilities for a project that is targeted, uh, that targeted the marginalized, the DTF unit serves the able and the willing to pay. This is the middle class and above. So they do so to be able to now to pay back the loans promptly. Now, remember that these DTF units were actually designed to target the marginalized. Now, at the same time, the low income areas, they really dispose the water utility ponds or even these DTF units. This is because of the costs. They cannot be able to afford it. Now, this leaves space for cartels to exploit the already poor, um, the, the already poor people or the marginalized people since the tariffs are not regulated also because since uh, water service providers do not own exhausters most of them are privately owned therefore when sanitation marketers push for toilets emptying consumers oblige yes but in what conditions that is why we're having many pit emptiers working in unsafe environment especially during the fishing phase of uh, of, of, of the exhausters work. Then at the same time, the problem is where is this shit uh, disposed at if it's not reaching the DTF units that have already been funded. So we keep on asking ourselves as water sector actors, why is this happening? And it is basically because the project design did not incorporate a component to sustain behavior change, where toilets are also used to dispose solid waste. So, and at the same time, a poorly designed subsidy is also partly to blame, where there's no accountability on proper toilet construction versus proper training and funds allocated. So the toilets even uh, end up being stores. And again, the toilets even end up being used for disposal of waste, of solid waste. And this again gives a lot of work to the pit emptiers, and it's also exposing them to very many risks. So, and then at the same time, um, we keep on asking why don't funds instead move to policy design that allows delegated management contracts between the private exhausters and the water utilities to ensure that we have equitable services provision, affordable uh, services, and also services that have complete management uh, mechanisms to ensure that people are not exploited. But the donors do not focus on the same as well. Last but not least is the issue of behavior change communication component. Uh, it usually takes a corporate messaging approach and this didn't work uh, at all in terms of sustaining behavioral change, especially after construction of toilets. And that's why even despite these users being given a subsidy to construct toilets, they still ended up as stores. They still ended up being used to even dispose uh, solid waste matter. Then at the same time, um, also budgets are limited for this uh, very most important part of the activity because it's not about just building infrastructure. It's about providing a service that is going to last for a long time. But this situation is also attributed to the politics of knowledge. Why should all guidance come from the technical advisors from the north? It's more reason most sanitation product, uh, projects are usually stuck in pilot stage and they're not moving into projects because, again, uh, donors want to compete on who has the best innovations, who is coming with the best knowledge and the likes. And it's not about that. It's still about the services that, are, as I had in indicated earlier. So despite being informed that the project will fail, why wasn't caution taken? Is it because white supremacy considers uh, the uh, black people and people in color as only knowledge consumers and not producers? Unfortunately, as they're speaking, some of these water sub, uh, service providers that call the bluff of these donors, they no longer are considered for funding because they are not complying in quotes to what they want to do. And that is basically implementing failure. And 
the worst part is that when we look at the results of such projects, nobody is out here to come and say your results are exaggerated or they are not right. So um, I, I, I can see a question on what can Susanna be able to do? What can other WASH organizations that are also listening to do? Um, I believe for me, the first aspect that needs to be done is the fact that we need to change our mindsets. And uh, this, this was said by George Bernard, and he said that those who cannot change their mind cannot change anything. So I believe let's start by changing the norm on the perception of Africa's wash knowledge products and platforms as being inferior. Please, donors, listen. Then at the same time, um, in, uh, the second aspect that I would advise is that I would say that let's continue talking about decolonization of wash as all the three components are linked. That is water, sanitation, and hygiene. This is not a zero-sum game, ladies and gentlemen. Our gain is a gain to humanity and the whole sector. And this is why, in a report shared in 2017 by Global Water Leaders, apparently we are losing 323 billion per year on bad water and sanitation. And I've just given an example of the same. Therefore, the cost of coping with inadequate wash access is rising faster than utility investment in a sector with already dwindling funds. My example has exhibited how, by and large, the ex extent of sanitation failures are attributed to the existing white supremacy in the sector. Nobody wants the investments to dip. I believe this should have no donor sitting pretty right now, wherever you're listening at. Instead, bring your voice on the table by setting up policies that will decolonize the wash sector. Also, when you look at my initial opinion piece on Medium, it indicated that what is political. And this, this whole discussion that we're also having today, it's also political. In this regard, I perceive that in any water week or any other event that we'll have. And I'm also so glad that Susanna brought me on board. If we are not highlighting the issues to do with decolonization, I believe we will be speaking Chinese. And to drive my point home, Critical will be seek, uh, seeking the audience with the high level panels during these events, because if we don't get the matter addressed with watertight policy resolutions, then water sector investors and donors should be more worried than we are, as the dwindling funds they approve for the sector will continue dipping on white elephant projects for as long as these um, systemic issues continue remaining unresolved. Thirdly, it's on the issues of structures in organization. Um, wash organizations and donors should be wary of a communications department and instead have a communication learning and adaptation department. Let's separate this agenda from the marketing principle. And my, uh, my uh, discussion on the issues to do with behavioral change communication have clearly indicated so, because the latter, in terms of the marketing department, is keen on what? That is the number of beneficiaries attained with safe water access. But the former looks at the how. How is this done? What concepts were used? And this is now going to allow other actors besides even the donor themselves or even any other institution like Susanna to be able to now scrutinize on agenda, get the learning, including the failures. Let's talk about them openly. Then also the grants and resource mobilization departments, they also need to be decolonized. How and what are they buying or selling to the donors or investors on wash challenges in developing countries? How is this information packaged? when they get it wrong in terms of buying or maybe selling of, uh, of our agenda, we are getting wrong the whole project implementation and we are moving again into white elephants. And then the key principles of procurement is fairness, while in human resources is equal opportunity employment. But this is far-fetched from reality. When you look at what's happening in Africa, we still um, wonder a lot. Um, to acquire donor funding on a value proposition for such departments to encourage uh, quality merit talent in the organization. Then, um, fourthly, is the issue on knowledge. Uh, define, let's define what a good knowledge uh, product is, by and large. Um, then, at the same time, um, can we provide platforms with proper structures that can produce a variety of knowledge products that are multilingual and where Africans can set their knowledge management agenda? And it's a good thing from the opening remarks today we've had that Suzanne is going to be doing this for Africa. That's very commendable. Also, now, after we after that, can we be able to read Africa? Uh, can we be able to cite our products uh, as well? That, that again is going to support uh, the agenda better. Um, 
also donors it will be interesting for donors uh, to shift from developing knowledge products that only discuss uh, some beneficiary stories but let's also move to the uh, or impact stories let's also move into now uh, discussing on the processes of implementation of the agenda that is where for me uh, the learning is so as i close the zulu of south africa define ubuntu as i am because you are and for me i believe knowledge is generational and collective so many thanks to you, Susanna, for the opportunity and all who attended and their questions as well. We, I believe we are all in the right side of history and generations are not going to judge us harshly in the likely event that this struggle succeed. Let us continue localizing the WASH agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ophrisia. Your thoughts and are very inspirational for us, and I think we'll take really serious this in invitation or claim, let's say, to rethink and decolonize the wash sector. And I think it's, as you mentioned, it's a great start to have a, an African chapter coming about from a demand-based organization. So um, thank you very much. We do have some questions. You can see there are some very good comments and we are very happy to have this, this positive feedback and some already some questions for the discussions later. But first, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Shibesa Pensulo, who will be having uh, our last speak for today. Shibesa is the water specialist at the Green Climate Fund where she's responsible for technical review of funding proposals for water resources management and wash projects. She is an environmental engineer and just like us with a passion for sustainable development. She thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for the introduction and uh, many thanks to the Susanna Secretariat for inviting me to take part in this session. When I started putting together this presentation, my plan was to speak about climate finance for sanitation and wastewater management in general, globally. But because there's such a lack of information uh, on climate finance for sanitation out there, I'm going to have to limit my presentation to the GCF only. Now, I thought I should start by uh, giving a brief overview of the GCF for the sake of those that might not be familiar with, with it. Um, the GCF was established as one of the channels through which developing countries can access uh, finance for climate change adaptation and mitigation. And it's the world's largest dedicated climate fund. Um, in the initial resource mobilization, GCF raised $10.3, $10.3 billion. Uh, for the first uh, five-year period of operation, which was 2015 to 2019. Uh, we had a very successful first replenishment last year in which we raised $9.8 billion for the four-year period 2020 to 2023. So we have more funds per year now than we did before. Um, GCF is mandated to prioritize least developed countries, small island developing states and African states, uh, because of their high vulnerability to climate change. And GCF is governed by a board with equal representation of developed and developing countries. So it's 12 board members from each. And the secretariat is based in uh, Incheon, South Korea with uh, 250 staff. So I'm speaking to you from Incheon tonight and uh, it's past 10 p.m. here. So uh, good evening to you all. Now, um, GCF makes funding available through organizations that have gone through an accreditation process. And currently, the GCF has a good mix of direct access entities and international accredited entities. Now, the direct access entities are national or regional organizations uh, through which a country can access funds uh, directly into the country for implementation of projects that you know, they have uh, designed themselves with their local institutions. Whereas the international accredited entities um, are a mix of uh, multilateral and bilateral uh, entities. And some of them, as you can see, are also members of uh, SUSANA, such as GIZ, FAO, and JICA. So we certainly have organizations that are active in the sanitation space, 
uh, that are accredited to the GCF. Now, um, I thought I should tell you a little bit about the current uh, status of uh, sanitation and wastewater management in the GCF portfolio. Uh, so far, GCF has approved 128 projects across the eight result areas that we have. So you could think of these result areas as clusters of sectors. Now, sanitation is part of the result area that we call health and well being, food and water security. So you can see there's quite a few sectors that are clustered under that results area. Now, out of the 128 approved projects so far, only seven of them have sanitation components. So there's not a single project that is focused on sanitation. And even out of the seven that have sanitation components, not all of them, um, in, in not all of them are the, the components funded by GCF. In, in some of them, the sanitation component is funded by a partner organization. But I want to speak a little about the three projects that have sanitation components or wastewater management components that are financed by GCF. Um, the first of these is a project for the capital city of Kiribati. Uh, it's, a, it's a town called South Tarawa. Um, and this is actually a water supply project. It's a desalination project powered by renewable energy, but it does contain one sanitation activity to be funded by GCF. And this is an awareness raising program on the relationship between climate change and WASH. Uh, so as you might imagine, this is quite a small component of the, the total project budget. The second one um, is in a project in Bahrain. Uh, this project is about uh, water governance and uh, capacity building and knowledge management in the water sector. Um, and it includes, again, an awareness uh, campaign. This one focused on wastewater recycling with the hope that once the negative perception of using or reusing wastewater is overcome, the country will be in a position to start uh, treating its wastewater to drinking water quality and putting it back into the water supply system. Um, and this project also has a component on uh, producing guidelines on grey water reuse at household level and also in public buildings uh, such as mosques and, and shopping malls. Um, the third one, I think this is the one where we actually have the largest uh, uh, GCF uh, funding amount going towards uh, wastewater recycling. So this is a project in uh, Palestine in which um, water uh, coming out of a wastewater treatment plant is being used to recharge the groundwater and that is then being recovered for use in irrigation. Um, and the project is also building the capacity of the Palestine Water Authority uh, to be able to manage the water quality uh, of this treated wastewater, both at the point of infiltration into the aquifer and at the point of recovery for irrigation. Now, we've established that, you know, most of the groundwork for funding projects uh, sanitation projects with climate funds is already there. The willingness to do it is most certainly there. The partners to do it are there. The money to do it is there. So the question is, why aren't there more climate financed sanitation projects? Now, um, initially, I thought I should try to answer this question. But as I'm speaking to the sanitation community, I think it's better to ask the question and um, open this up as a discussion. So what, what could be the reasons why there's so little climate finance going towards sanitation currently? Could it be that the impacts of climate change on sanitation systems are under-researched, that we don't yet know enough about how climate change is affecting sanitation systems? Could it be that despite of all the work and all the efforts over the past 15 years and, and longer to prioritize sanitation, that water supply project proponents still overlook it? Could it be that the mitigation potential of sanitation is difficult to quantify 
I mean, we know that uh, we can reduce emissions by harvesting biogas and biomass and using them for energy, but is it that we can't measure and quantify those emissions reductions to be able to you know, bring a project to a climate fund to, to finance? Or could it be that despite all of the efforts to come up with bankable business models for sanitation, to position sanitation as a business opportunity, that we are still lacking, you know, projects that can really that can really fill this space. I mean, the GCF doesn't only give grants, we also provide loans and guarantees and equity. So there's certainly more than one window open through which sanitation projects could be funded. But is it that the models that we currently have for, for businesses in this field are not yet fully developed? Or could it be that from the perspective of people working in the climate space, that because sanitation is mentioned only in very few of the national determined uh, contributions that were submitted to uh, the UNFCCC, that, that sanitation is not recognized yet as a climate change issue? Um, so these are the five the thoughts, the five points that I pondered over, wondering what needs to be done. Uh, to direct more climate finance towards sanitation. Um, and I think that once we know which of these or which others are the key challenges, we will know what we need to do to overcome them. If the issue is a lack of research into the linkages between sanitation and climate change, well, then we know that research is where we need to focus our efforts. If the issue is still on uh, sanitation being overlooked, then the advocacy with our friends in uh, the other subsectors of the water sector needs to be stepped up. If it's mitigation potential, the measurements, the modeling, um, then that's what we need to work on. If it's the bankable models that are lacking, we need to strengthen those. And if it's the lack of prioritization in the NDCs, well, um, these are currently under revision. So all of the countries that have submitted nationally determined contributions to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change are supposed to be starting a process of revising them this year. And so this is an opportunity to make sure that sanitation gets into those NDCs so that it rises in the climate change agenda. So with these thoughts, I would like to end my presentation and I hope that we have a few minutes for discussion so that uh, we can hear what the audience think are you know, the real challenges here and, and how to get more money, uh, climate funds in particular, into sanitation. Thanks very much and over to you, Cecilia. <laughs> Thank you, Shibeza. Yes, I was just having a look at the comments here and I can see one from from King that, yes, as that's uh, a re resounding yes. And there has been people agreeing already. And another one from Abhishek Narain that's still fuzzy in the narrative, so it do need uh, to create, reinvent, rewrite the narratives mm. all the time in order to bring sanitation to the agenda. I'm looking at the clock and we are a bit behind schedule, but I still would like to invite uh, Euphrygia and take up one or two questions from, from the participants. Um, just to mention, yes, the thank you, Dorothy, <laughs> great women power meeting. Yeah, this meeting is being recorded and will be on the Susanna YouTube channel afterwards, as well as Shivisa's presentation and the one throughout the week. Also, we had a question before dire directed to WSSCC. Uh, regarding their strategy for the new fund, maybe we can ask the colleagues from, from WSSCC to post that, that directly to the forum uh, so all of us can, can have access to that. So just looking here, can we have exactly, um, can we have one question for, for Euphrygia or how are we going? with the questions. Uh, 
Okay, one question from Vishwanath. Uh, thank you for the presentation. He's asking us if the corruption uh, of the ruling elites uh, and bureaucracy are also not part of are also not part of the problem. Maybe you'd like to say a word on that. If not, I would say yes, <laughs> but that's my very personal opinion. Um, Afrija, uh, can you yeah. hear us? Yes. Yeah, now I can hear you. I was having yes. a problem with the internet. Yes, um, I, I would definitely agree to his comment. Definitely, definitely, because these uh, issues are not happening on an open space. And that is why I feel like uh, addressing most of these issues will have to take uh, take center stage from the perspective of, polic of, of policy. So if donors set up a policy, even the ruling elite uh, will have to be able to oblige on the same. So most of uh, most of issues to do with decolonization have to take a policy approach. If you change the structures, if the policy does not provide any soft landing, then we will be pre basically putting water in, um, in, in a broken uh, bucket. It will continue leaking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Euphrasia. Uh, also, another comment from Abhishek and just reacting to GCF. Uh, the GCF links need to be in GCF and sanitation links need to be highlighted and strengthened. That's a clear yes also from, from the community here. And we do have a working group on climate change that aims to address also such issues. Yeah, a comment from Elizabeth from Munch. Thank you, Elizabeth. I look forward to more concrete steps that we can take at Susanna. I assume she was yeah re uh, referring to the decolonization now debate here, and. I think that a meeting like this one today, it's very important because it makes very clear the four roles of Susanna that Francie has mentioned before. And as well as a working platform, we do have some work, homework to do as well. And uh, I think a discussion thread in the forum is a good start for that and perhaps a good place um, to, to take up other voices on this matter. Mm, I have one question here to GCF as well. The major problem is that sanitation has always been regarded as a household affair. Do you have an opinion on that, Shibesa? Do you would like to comment to that? Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I agree. I think that there are project proponents that, I have, that have been putting out those sanitation projects and large scale ones for several years now. Um, but I think it's an interesting perspective. Uh, I would like to, to hear more about it. Uh, is it the idea that um, water service provision uh, should be centralized, but sanitation should uh, always remain de decentralized? Is that the, the perspective? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that we, are, we still have more questions coming up. Um, and it's actually a suggestion that we can continue to, to take up this, this point of the awareness uh, between sanitation and climate, uh, take some actions also in Susanna. And I think that uh, places like Susanna are actually made for that. So we can get together, had new ideas. Um, also, Vishwanath has a good, uh, has a comment and related to the project in, in a Palestine. Good. So I would say we, we continue to receive the comments. We can, we thank you very much for being there with us. We thank you very much for your patience, uh, for our lovely speakers. I would like to invite all the others who are still in the call, just sitting at the backstage to, to say a quick goodbye to you, all of you. And of course, I would like to 
give you a big, big thanks to all of you who are here, who just joined the meeting, who are on the backstage. Uh, without all of you, this wouldn't have been possible. Stay tuned, stay connected, and we will see throughout the week. Thank you very much for everything we've learned and heard today. Note taken. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay on for the outlook. Yes, we'll be presenting quickly an overview of the sessions in the coming weeks. So thank you, thank you very much. Hope we are in touch and bye. Obrigado, mãe. Bye-bye. <laughs>